You know, last week, you know, we're in this series called Passion, and Pastor Gary spoke about on-the-spot prayer and just praying over people by name right there on the spot. And it was cool to do that just now. It was cool to see last night after our service just in the lobby, people just putting that to action and just praying over people in the lobby. So hopefully we'll continue that, that culture here at South Bay Community Church. Well, we're in this last message for the series called Passion. And before I get into the, the message and the word, I want to ask you a simple question. And I'd love to hear from you. The question is this, what is something you love? What is something maybe you're passionate about, something interesting or unique? And the way I want to hear from you is this. Would you take out your cell phone? If you're able to text, would you take out a cell phone? I want you to text us your answers. And what you want to do is you want to text to the number 22333. And then in the body, go ahead and type in 553-573 along with your answer. Just in about a word or two, what is something you love or you're passionate about? And when I say go, hit send, and then in a few moments, we're going to see those answers pop up on the stage. Okay, so as you're typing that in your phone, and as you're thinking about that, let me just share with you some of the things our staff loves, right? I've, I've asked our staff, what are some things you're passionate about? And we're quite different. So, for example, Mandy Ogamori in the office, she, I mean, she's a bright lady, uh, nice person, but she loves the color black. She loves everything black. So if you ever go to their house along with her husband, Darren, their, their, their decor is all black and white. You go, if you went to their wedding, their wedding colors were black. If you see that picture of her ring, her engagement ring is literally a black diamond. And her fingernails are black. And that's not from changing the tires. She decided to paint her nails black. She loves black. And to me, that's, that's strange to me. But she loves it. And then we have Pastor Dave. And, man, if I can summarize his love in just a phrase, it would be simply naked pita chips. He loves Stacy's simply naked pita chips. He literally eats these every day. Every day, along with a can of Diet Mountain Dew. That's your pastor. That's Pastor Dave. Okay, then we all, know, we, we all know Pastor Gary and his love for Star Wars. And I know you've heard stories about his toys and his collections, but I, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. Here's a picture of what we took. This is only what we could fit in the frame. This is just a part of his collection. This kid is a big kid. He loves Star Wars. And... By the way, please don't buy him any more. He's trying to get rid of all this stuff, okay? So that's Pastor Gary. And then for me, you guys know that I, I love to surf, right? You, you know I love to surf. But I don't know if you know that I have this infatuation with surfboards. I love surfboards. In fact, I have a blog called The Board Hoarder. I don't tell people about it. It's my own little thing. But it's called The Board Hoarder. And I document all the surfboards that I've collected over the years. I buy and sell. And I just, I could, I could stare at surfboards forever, okay, all day long. And so I want to ask you now, what is something you love? Go ahead and hit send, and then the, those answers will be popping up here on stage. What does South Bay Community Church love? Guys, got, got Okay, so we got Patriots. We got Patriot fans. Someone's passionate about them. Someone's passionate about dolphins and shamus. Killer whales. We got people who love World Cup soccer. Man, this is making me dizzy. Any, someone loves Oreos. Somebody loves cycling. I bet I know who that is. Somebody loves Pastor Gary. Oh, wow. That, that's nice, Cheryl. Um, somebody loves watching their kids play basketball. Somebody obviously loves the Kings. Um, yeah. Let's, let's read a couple more. Uh, movies, shopping, someone loves their wife, Denver Broncos. You. <laughs> you, you see a lot of different passions and loves represented in this group. You know one thing I didn't see up here, and I didn't expect to see, but nobody said that they love laws. Like when was the last time you saw something or you, you, you met someone who said, man, I am just infatuated with the laws of California. I mean, I can't stop thinking about them. Or every night before I sleep, I can't help but read over the Constitution of the United States of America. It's just always on my mind. That would be strange, right? Wouldn't that be so weird? Nobody loves laws. 
But then I thought about it this past week. There's actually somebody I know who is passionate about loss. Do you know what the longest psalm in the book of Psalm is? Longest psalm, Psalm 119. It's actually the longest chapter in the entire Bible, Psalm 119. It has 176 verses, and in those 176 verses, this psalmist, the guy who wrote these psalms, he's talking about how much he loves, he's head over heels for the law of the Lord, the Torah, in other words, the Scriptures. For example, let me show you verse 97 in Psalm 119. It says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. And he has other words for, for the law. He calls them precepts or commands or statutes or rules or words. In verse 103, the psalmist says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That is strong language. This guy is in love with the tastiness of God's words. And my question is, why is he so passionate about God's law? And it's because he doesn't see these as merely rules and regulations and restrictions. In fact, he'll tell you there's so much more than that. In verse 165, he says, they give me peace. In verse 82, he says, they give me comfort. In verse 81, he says, man, they give me hope. Verse 77, they are my delight. Verse 29, he says, they protect me. In verse 115, he says, they're my guidance. In verse 24, they're my counsel. And on and on and on for 176 verses, he's talking about how much he loves this. In other words, this, the law of God, the words of God don't restrict my life. They actually give me life. Like he says literally in verse 93, they don't restrict my life, they enhance my life. These give me the fullness of life as my God has intended for me. That's why I love this book. You know, Pastor Gary and I, we, we came back from Japan. This is why we're doing this message on passion. And, and one of the things that we loved about this trip was just our conversation back and forth. I mean, it's such... Such rich fellowship between us. And some of the best conversations were conversations about this book right here. We, we told ourselves when we went that we would go through the book of Ephesians together for our quiet times. And, and we would get together and we would share some of the things God was teaching us. And some of the things God was putting on our heart. And, and those conversations were so sweet. And we, we asked ourselves, when we come back, what do we want to encourage our church with? What, what do we want to encourage you with? What kind of Christians do we want to see developed out of South Bay Community Church? And we agreed many things, but one thing, hands down, was that we want you guys to be people who are passionate, passionately in love with God's Word. That, that all throughout the week, throughout the lobby, throughout your life group meetings, throughout your times of hanging out, that the Word of God would just be on our lips. That we would just constantly be encouraging each other, not with just nice and, and wise words, but words that come from God Himself. We, we pray so much that you experience what we got to experience as we mutually edified each other and built each other up with God's words, his laws. And so I want to encourage you guys today, this last message in the series is passion for the word. And I have this challenging task, how do I, how do I challenge you or encourage you to be passionate over God's word? Well, I want to do it by, by looking at Psalm 119. I want to try to look at the heart of this psalmist who he himself was so in love with it. So would you guys journey with me through Psalm 119? Go ahead and open your Bible, if you have it with you, to that chapter. And as you're doing that, let's, let's uh, pause and come before the Lord in prayer. God, we, we just want to grow more and more in love with you, God. We just want to have a passion that is uncontainable. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you would be moving right now as, as we are sitting here quietly listening to your word, I pray that you would just really stir within our hearts, Lord. That you would cause us to just be mad about your word. That we would just fall deeply in love with Jesus Christ because of what we learn about you in your word. So Lord, I pray that every single one of us, we would give you our ears and our hearts that we would be attentive to how your Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And God, I pray that this message wouldn't very, be very successful at all 
that it wouldn't be memorable, that it wouldn't be convicting unless it comes from you and unless it comes from your truth and the truth of your word. And so, Lord, we, we give this time to you. Would you be our teacher, God? We thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can I encourage you guys to follow along with me in your program notes? The first thing I, I see when I look at this psalmist and his writings is this. I see a passion for the word that feels a passion to walk righteously. A passion for the word feels a passion to walk righteously. Remember that first message we gave on passionate worship and we talked about how, man, we have a God who is holy. We have to see him that way. We have to have a high view of a God who is righteous and without sin. And if we come to grips with that kind of God and we see that God is a holy God, then that should make us want to be holy too, like him. That should make us want to be righteous too, like him. And in the first verse of Psalm 119, the psalmist says this. He says, blessed are those whose ways are blameless. In other words, whose ways are righteous, who walk according to what? According to the law of the Lord. Verse 9, later on in that chapter, he says, how can a young man stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so what the psalmist is saying, man, if I can just take God's word and if I could just tuck it into my heart, I know that in those times when I'm tempted to walk unrighteously or I'm tempted to fall into sin, the word of God can be there on my lips to help me actually walk righteously. And I, I, I've talked about in the past, actually my first message ever here at South Bay Community Church, how our heart is like an armory. It's like an armory where we store up weapons. Or you guys know what an armory is? An army at war will always have an armory, and if they're a good army, strategic army, they will fill it with all sorts of weapons, right? Anything from hand knives to handguns, from assault rifles to rocket launchers. And in the same way, we have an armory. Our heart is an armory where we store spiritual weapons. Why that language? Because Ephesians 6 tells us that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. This is the spirit's weapon. And where does it store? Well, it's stored in our hearts. What, why does it call it the spirit's sword? Why is it the spirit's weapon? Well, look at John 14, 26. John 14, 26 says, this is the Holy Spirit's role in our life. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, circle that word teach, he will teach you all things and will remind you. Circle that word remind. He will remind you of everything I've said to you. So the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, part of it is to teach us God's words and to remind us of God's words. When, when does he teach it to us? Well, any time you're exposed to God's word, whether it's by reading it through your quiet time or maybe you're listening to a preacher speak the word of God or maybe you're in your car and you're listening to a sermon, you're... you're interacting with God's words. And whenever you're able to understand it, the Holy Spirit is the one who's actually helping you understand it. He is teaching it to you. So you have two options. You could hear these words and it'll fly right over your head, or you can actually take it captive and the Holy Spirit will teach it to you. And when he teaches it to you, he stores it in your heart. He stores it in your heart. Well, when does he remind us of it? Well, in those moments when we're tried or we're tempted or we're going through a situation in life, the Holy Spirit will retrieve it. He will reach into the army of your heart and he will bring to mind things that you have stored in the past. So in other words, he teaches us by putting the word in our hearts and he reminds us by retrieving it from our hearts in those times of need. Right? How do we give that to the Holy Spirit? Right? We, we have to give him something to work with. Do you guys remember that message I spoke about um, how to find that perfect person to marry? Do you guys remember that message? No? Because I never gave it, so I'm glad you don't remember it. Last night it was kind of embarrassing because I'm like, how many people remember that message? About five, six hands go up. I'm a liar. I never gave that message. I never gave that message here. And, and I could sit here and try to get you to remember it. Come on, guys, remember, remember what my points were? And I could try and try, but I can't remind you of something that's never been put in your mind. 
I could challenge you, give me the three points of that message. There were no points. There was no message. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit could only remind us of what has been stored in us in the first place. But the problem is so many of us have armories that I'm afraid are ill-equipped. That frightens me. As a pastor, I, I, I worry that some of us are here this morning hearing the word of God. You, you have no intention to touch the word or take in the word until next weekend if, if you come. And if that's the case and that's the pattern of your life, then I'm telling you, your, your armory is going to be ill-equipped. And we can't be that kind of church. Let me, let me illustrate something for you guys. Would you, would you guys all stand with me? Let, let, let's do an activity right now. I want to show you something cool. We're going to participate, and I'm going to say something. I'm going to start off a phrase, and if you think you know what I'm saying, I want you to, to in one voice, in, in a strong, unified voice, finish my sentence. Okay, so I'll say something like, what goes up? Good, good, all right. Or I'll say a phrase or a slogan like, I want my baby back. All right, chilies. Okay, or I'll, I'll say something like, just like a good neighbor. <laughs> yeah. Some of you guys are a little off key, but that's okay. <laughs> or I'll say M I C M O U. Yeah, we got some musketeers in here. Or I'll say something like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 1. Got some Bible scholars. Good. For God so loved the world, He. That whoever shall not but have, all right, you guys got a John 3.16 in there. How about this? Do not be anxious about anything, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever you said. How about this? Sanctify them by your truth. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Where, where's everyone at? Go ahead and sit down. I, I did that to show you that it makes sense, right? I understand why we started off so strong and so confident at the beginning, right? Because these are things that we hear all the time. We've heard them more than a few times in the culture around us, on the TV, on the Internet. And so it takes a simple cue for you to remember, and all of a sudden it's on your lips. You finish it right away. But what would it be like, church, if we were a church that constantly exposed ourselves more than just a few times to the Word of God? So that in situations where, where there's something that we're facing and, or going through, the Holy Spirit gives us a cue, and all of a sudden, that Word is on our lips. And we're able to walk righteously because the Word of God has been stored in our hearts, and the Holy Spirit is able to retrieve it and remind us. Why, why would an army need an armory? And why would a, a good army need an armory filled with all sorts of different weapons? Why the hand knives and hand grenades and handguns and rifles and, and rocket launchers? Because there's different kind of battles, right? Different situations they're going to find themselves in. What, what if you're in charge of your army's army one day and, and you take a look at these handguns that the, the military issues to you and you, you think, man, this thing is a good gun. It's precise. It's powerful. I could take anyone out in just one shot. And so you say, you know, that's, that's all we really need. And so in your armor, you go ahead and store that one handgun and, and, and some others of the same handgun. And you're out on the field one day with your, your, with your army. You're there in the camp. And all of a sudden, you guys hear this loud rumble in the distance, this huge rumbling. And you look, and over the hill comes a whole fleet of armored tanks. And you start panicking because they're coming right at you and their barrels are pointed at you. What do you do? You run into the armory. What do you got? Um, handguns. You come out. What are you going to do? Pew, pew, pew. Right? No, fail. That will fail. So, so you think about that and you're like, okay, that is so foolish. That is dumb. I, I need to be better stocked. Okay. Um, rocket launchers. Rocket launchers would do me much better. It, it can do everything a handgun can do, but just more powerful. So let's get rid of the handguns. Let's just put rocket launchers in our armory. And so you're just waiting. Come on, armor tanks. You're just waiting for them to come. But then you notice, you turn, and you see this enemy foot soldier come, and he grabs your buddy 
from behind, and he has him at knife point. Just imagine this with me. He has him at knife point. What are you going to do? You start panicking. And so you run into the armory. What do you got? Um, rocket launcher, right? <laughs> what in the world are you going to do with that at that moment? Take out the enemy and your buddy and the entire camp? That would be foolish. And so it would be wise for any army to, to stock it with as many different kind of weapons as possible because the truth and the reality is there's going to be different kind of situations and different kind of scenarios. Problem is, what if the army of our hearts only has that Genesis 1-1 or that John 3-16? That's, that's all you care to really take in as long as I know that. And one day you're hanging out your friends and you're... you're your struggle as a new Christian or even as a long-time Christian is, is gossip. And God's been speaking to you. You've got to stop gossiping. And you're with your friends that one day and everybody started to talk about this one person in church. And, and you're tempted to throw in your peace. And, but the Holy Spirit saying, no, don't do it. But sin's saying, come on, just say it, just say it. And so the Holy Spirit runs into the army of your heart. What's got? Genesis 1, here you go, here you go. No, no, I'm not going to say anything because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Guys. Which, which is true and powerful, but how is that going to help you in the temptation against gossip? Yet the more we stock the armory of our hearts with all sorts of different counsel and wisdom and scriptures and laws, the more the Holy Spirit can take and retrieve in those moments when we need it most. I have a friend named Ted who was out of the house one day and he had this huge argument with his mom, and she was just yelling at him, and he was yelling at her. They were going back and forth, and he, was, he just stormed out of the house just trying to blow off steam. So ticked off, and he's thinking about all the things he's going to say to her when he gets back, and all these things he's going to bring up, and how he's going to make her feel guilty. And he's out trying to cool down, and he goes to this, this liquor store. And he picks up some stuff, maybe some candy, some soda, I don't know. But he's so angry, and he goes, and he, he just slams it down on the counter. And the person at the cash register goes, uh, that'll be four twenty nine, sir. And he goes, excuse me? She goes, four twenty nine. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit reached into the army of his heart and took out Ephesians 4.29, a passage he had memorized in the past that says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth except what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit all who listen. Come on, Ted. Remember? Remember what we said. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And that was the weapon he needed in that moment when he wanted to go in unrighteousness and talk to his mom in a way that wasn't helpful. We got to give the Holy Spirit something to work with. And the more we can be passionate about God's word, not just passionate about coming to church on the weekends, but daily getting alone with this book and studying it and letting God speak to us, getting alone with our life groups or our, our group of friends where we can study the word together, programming our, our stations on a car so that we're constantly listening to messages from the word of God. The more we expose ourselves, the more we can grow in righteousness and holiness just like our God. Why was the psalmist so in love with the law? Because he has hidden the word in his heart, like verse 11 said, that he might not sin against God. Passion for the word fuels a passion to walk righteously. Amen? Amen. Here, here's the second thing I want to share from what I've seen this psalmist. A passion for the word fuels a passion to know God's will. See, a passion for the word fuels a passion to know God's will. Look at what he says in verse 24. He says, God, your statutes, which is another word for your laws or commands, your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. They're my counselors. A few weeks back, somebody came up to me in the lobby and asked me a, a, a simple question. He was like, Greg, what's God's will for my life? What, what am I supposed to do with my career? And that's actually a question that, that us pastors get quite often. What, what's, what's God's will for my life? And, and that question is a question we all ask. We all ask that decision question, what am I supposed to do? And if you're a Christ follower and a believer in God, I hope that that question is in the form of God. What is your will for my life? Lord, what do you want me to do? Am I supposed to work this job or am I supposed to work that job? 
Am I supposed to get married or God, do you want me to remain single? Should I date God? Should I date or should I not date? If I'm supposed to date, who am I supposed to date? My wife, Monica, we've been dating for five years before we actually got married. We dated five years. But before that, I don't know if you know this, but we actually prayed for more than two years just to figure out if we even should start dating. Over two years of praying just to figure out if we should even enter into a relationship together. And I remember very clearly it was uh, the month of November in 2002. We, we knew we liked each other and we had feelings and all this. But we didn't know if it was God's will for us to date and pursue each other. And so I told her at the beginning of November, I said, Monica, listen, for this whole month, let's not talk to each other. Let's not hang out or communicate. Let's just seek the Lord this month. And let's, let's ask God to speak to us. Let's listen for his voice to see if this is his will. And so that whole month, we, stick to, we, we stuck to that commitment. We didn't, we didn't hang out. We didn't talk. And we just sought the Lord all month long. And I remember it was the last month of November. I mean, the last day of November. And I'm laying in this room. We were actually in San Francisco. Uh, my family had a house in Daly City, and I was there with my friend. And we're laying there in this room. And I'm about to fall asleep for the last time in the month of November. I remember very clearly talking to God. God, I have been seeking you all month, God. I've been trying to hear your voice for our lives. God, you've been speechless. My God, speak to me. Throw me a bone. Say something to me. I don't want to go back to Monica without anything from you. And I remember thinking, God, if I close my eyes, that's it. That's it. And I'll have to say that I, I, I didn't hear anything from you, Lord, so please speak to me. Guess what happens just a few moments later? Guess what was heard in that room? <laughs> I knocked out, anticlimactic, anticlimactic, and I just fell asleep, and you have to know this about me, some of you do, Pastor Gary knows, because he spent 10 days with me in Japan, man, when I sleep, I sleep like a bear, like nothing wakes me up, a tornado can come to the place, the earth can shake, and I'm not waking up, Pastor Gary snores like a beast, and I, I never woke up once in Japan, and yet at 2 a.m., I'm suddenly awake at 2 a.m. to this And after we had fallen asleep, apparently it had started raining there in Daly City, and there was a leak in the, roof, in the roof, and it was hitting our hardwood floor in the living room outside. So this wasn't even in my room. I never wake up by anything around me, but there's a drip in the other room, dick, 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 and I'm laying there totally annoyed. I'm so irritated. I'm staring at the ceiling, wondering why in the world did that wake me up? And why in the world is that keeping me awake? And I'm just so irritated. I couldn't fall back to sleep. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit reached into the armory of my heart. And he gave me Proverbs 27.15. And Proverbs 27.15 says this true story. It says, a quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. <laughs> And I'm telling you, it's not like I'm some holy man who happened to memorize Proverbs 27, 15. Truthfully, I just read that passage because I was going through Proverbs just two days earlier in my quiet times. And that stuck out to me because that's a silly verse. And yet it was at that moment when I'm annoyed by this irritating drip that the Holy Spirit was saying, you know what, don't marry a quarrelsome wife because she's going to be like that. And here's what the Lord was saying to me besides the fact that you want to avoid a quarrelsome wife. Here's, here's what I believe the, the Lord was speaking to me so clearly. He was saying, Greg, you're not going to find out if Monica Chen is supposed to be the one you're super, supposed to pursue and marry one day. In fact, that's true. I looked up the concordance and Monica Chen is not there in my Bible. But what the Lord was saying is, look, I have given you everything you need in this word. I've revealed everything about my heart that I need you to know. My laws, my counsel, my guidance, my wisdom is clearly revealed to you. And so I thought to myself, yeah, Monica Chen is not going to show up in this Bible, but if I can just look at the guidelines and, and the wisdom and the counsel and the commands of God, maybe I can figure out if she's the one. And so I started weighing Monica against the counsel of Scripture. Does she contradict anything I know about God's word and his will for me? 
And to make a long story short, she's my baby mama now. Right? She, she, I married her, and we have two beautiful kids, and I believe that God has blessed our household. His favor has been upon us. And I think it's because we sought him and the will revealed in his word. Look at what Psalm 119.105 says. The psalmist says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. All we need to know about God's will is contained. All we have to do is read it and seek it and then follow it. And the truth is, I hate to say this, hate to break it to you, but, but God's will, the will you're trying to find, it's not meant to be found. Some of you guys are seeking God's will right now, trying to find it. It's not lost. It's not meant to be found. It's meant to be followed. It's meant to be followed. And, and what I mean by that, it's not meant to be found in the sense that it's not meant to be hidden. He, he's made it very plain to us. We just got to figure what figure out what it says, and then we follow it passionately with all our heart and with all our might. For example, the Bible tells us God's will very plainly in 2 Peter 3, 9, says his will is that we're saved, that no one should perish, but all should come to salvation through Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says God's will for us is that we're sanctified, that we avoid immorality and sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians, it tells us God's will for us is that we shouldn't be unequally yoked with people of different values and beliefs. Matthew 28 tells us that God's will is that we should go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. God's will has been very plain to us. And so will we read it? Will we take it in? And then will we respond and follow them passionately as if it were the light unto our path, our guidance? So who, who do I marry? So what job do I take, Pastor Greg? What, what, what car should I drive? What toothpaste should I pick out? Well, look, the Bible isn't going to have specific answers and instructions to everything we're seeking to know in the moment. It's not going to answer all the questions necessarily that we have. But, but here's, here's the truth. If you are living according to God's will as revealed to us, in this book, as he has made known, and you're doing all that you can to, to live within his counsel and his commands and his laws. And the truth is, man, anything outside of that, you can do whatever you please. You can marry who you want. You can work wherever you want to work. You can buy whatever car you want to car, as long as you're living within the will and counsel of God. Psalm 37, 4 says this. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That means take pleasure in God and his word. Be passionate about God and his word. And if that's the case and that describes your life, he'll give you your desires. Meaning he's going to put desires in our hearts. And our desires and our decisions are going to be birthed out of this pleasure that we have in following God and his word. I, 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 I took Monica and, and considered her and weighed her against scripture, and there is nothing about her or our relationship that, that was going to contradict what God taught me and what he, he counseled. And so I figured, that's my desire. I believe that's a godly desire, and so, so I married her. And if we too would be people who are passionate to know God's revealed will and to live according to those ways, that we can have the desires that God has placed in our heart. A passion for the word feels a passion to know God's will. Let me share with you one more thing, and this, this is the most important thing that I want to say today. And I hope you just really write this down and not just write this down, but would you soak it up? A, a, a passion for the word feels a passion for God himself. Would you guys write that in all caps? A passion for the word fuels a passion for God himself. Go ahead and circle that whole thing. Go ahead and underline it, highlight it, put stars all around it. Because this is the most essential thing that we need to understand. Verse 57 says this. He cries out to God. He says, you are my portion, Lord. You are my portion. Lord, I have promised to obey your words. And I love that biblical language. Lord, you are my portion. And I've, I've saying that 
line many times in worship songs, and I've heard it many times, but I never understood what it meant when, when the biblical writer said, God, you are my portion, until I studied Psalm 119. In the Hebrew language, portion was in reference to an inheritance that somebody got, an allotment of land. Right, so if I gave an inheritance to my two children, I'd say, all right, Evan, here, here's your portion. This is for you. It's all yours. And then Karis, here is your portion. This is all for you. And what it came to, to be, as the Hebrews understood, was this is my inheritance. This is my gain. Oftentimes it was what they were rewarded with. This is my gift. You know, I, I was sharing how Monica and I were praying for over two years, whether or not we should date. Now, I'll tell you why it was so difficult for, for us to move forward. A big part of that reason was because one of my best friends had a crush on Monica. He liked Monica, and I vowed that I would not pursue her unless he gave me his full blessing. And so, you know, we prayed, and I have to tell you, it was a difficult time. That's not a normal thing, at least not for me. I, I've, I've never liked someone for that long and, and did nothing about it. But I couldn't do anything about it but just sit and wait and pray. God, do you want us to be together? And then two years later, my friend finally came up to me, and I thank God that he, he is a godly man, a man of the word. He, he came up to me. I remember very clearly we were at a retreat, Big Bear Lake, um, and he comes up to me and he says, Greg, I was doing my quiet time this morning and I was reading Genesis 22. And it's that story where Abraham lays his son Isaac at the altar and he just gives it up all to the Lord. And he says, Lord, I, I trust you. I trust you to provide. And he says, Greg, I, I feel like this whole thing is, is my Isaac. And I think I just got to lay it down. I just got to give to the Lord and trust that he's going to provide. And he says, Greg, you have my blessing. And when he told me that, I was like, yeah, boy. I was so excited. I was so stoked. Finally, after two years, I can go ahead and move forward. And yet, I, I didn't jump on it right away. I, I waited a couple months because I, I still wanted to be sensitive to the whole thing. I, know, I knew it was a hard thing for him. But when we finally got together and, and I asked her to be my girlfriend, do you ima can you imagine what that was like for me? It was like, yes, finally, you are my reward. You are my greatest gain. Up to this point in my life, you are my treasure. That's what it was like, and that's what it was like for the psalmist when he thinks about God. God, you are my reward. You are my portion. You are my inheritance. You are my delight. You are my treasure. That, that's what it was to him. And so he says in that verse, he says, so I will promise to obey your words. Now that I have you as my portion, I will obey your words. And you read all of those 176 verses in Psalm 19, it's easy to see that this man, man, he was in love with the word of God. He was just in love with it. But here's the thing, you can't truly love the word of God like the psalmist did without truly loving the God of this word. Amen? You can't truly love the word of God without truly falling in love and being passionate about the God of this word. Pastor Gary and I and, and Pastor Dave and all the other pastors, man, we desire so much for you, church, that you would fall in love and be passionate about God's word. But we pray that you wouldn't just be passionate about God's word. But that would be a means for you to fall in love with God himself. So the higher and greater, the greatest purpose of falling in love with God himself. The person, the person behind this. And so the, how can we pursue the Lord? Well, according to the psalmist, it's through his commandments. Look, look at verse 10. He says, with my whole heart I seek you. You refers to a person. It's a personal pronoun. He says, I seek you, God, so let me not wander from what? from your commands, from your words. How can I seek you? By, by seeking your commands. This is a stepping stone for me to pursue you with my whole heart. And sometimes, church, we miss the point. We completely miss the point. When I was growing up as a junior higher and a high schooler, I was so good at reading this book. 
I, I was so good at doing my quiet times every day. Because I was told at church that, that if you do your quiet times, you'll be a good Christian. And good Christians do their quiet times. And so I, I took that seriously, and I did my quiet times every day. And we would go to church on Sunday mornings, and we would have this chart with all our names on it. And every time you did your quiet time, they would put a mark saying you did it that day. Or that, that many times this week, you did your quiet time. You get a sticker. You get a mark. And I was passionate about making sure that I got marks all across the board. And I'll tell you what, I led those charts. Junior high and high school, I rarely missed a day of quiet times. Rarely. But I'll tell you what, through that whole experience, man, my time with the Word, it was boring. It was drudgery to me. I hated it so many times. Not, not all the time. Sometimes it's really good. But, but man, was it boring. I mean, it, it was hard for me to crack open that book. And I think it was like that because my priorities were misplaced. Because I missed the point. I had this facade of here's this kid who is passionate about God and his word. But underneath that facade, underneath the surface, here's this kid who is passionate about himself. I'm passionate about me and accomplishing this task and this challenge that's been presented to me. Sometimes when we come before the Lord and we're trying to be passionate, whether it's passionate about worship or passionate about praying for people or passionate about the Word, sometimes it's all about taking our eyes off of Jesus and, and fixing it on ourselves. In this success-oriented culture that we find ourselves in, it's about can I complete the task? Can I conquer the challenge? When it should be about God himself. Where are our, your eyes fixed on? A passion for God's word should be just the means so that we would fall in love with the God of this word. When, when I was in high school, over at West High, man, I was in love. I was in love. And uh, there was this girl that I was just crazy about. And, and the girls at my school, they, they would always like to write letters to one another, to all their friends. And they would, you know, we didn't have like, texting or we didn't have Facebook or email. They, they would actually write on this weird contraption called um, paper. You guys remember that? Way back in the day, they actually wrote on this stuff called paper and they, they would write these letters and then they would fold them up in all these creative ways and then they would hand them out to their friends between periods. And I, so I would get letters from my friends and, and I, I, I would take it to the next class, the next period, and I would unfold it. And for all my friends, I would read it and then once I read it, I would just put it away. And I never revisited those letters. I just got what they were saying, put it away. But when there was this girl that I was crazy about, when she wrote me a letter, man, I didn't treat it like all the other letters. I, I hid that thing in my backpack, and I would wait till I went home. I wouldn't read at school. I wanted to wait till I got home, alone in my room. I just wanted no distractions because I was going to soak this up. And I would open that letter and I would sometimes just lay there on my bed and I would read every single word that she wrote to me. And, and for her letter, just her letter, I would read it over and over again. Just, not just once, I, I would read it multiple times. And especially those phrases or those sentences that, that really stuck out to me. The ones where she was expressing how she felt about me and her affections for me. Or maybe she was saying something flattering about me. Those were the ones I just ate up. I just sat there and I would read those over and over again. And then I would finish that letter. I would put it away in a, in a shoe box. And every once in a while I would revisit that shoe box and I would take out the past letters. And I would read them again and again. I loved reading those letters. But what was it about those letters that made me so giddy or so joyful or so happy about reading them? It wasn't that I, I, I was able to finish the letter from beginning to end and, and pat myself on the back and g give myself a sticker and said, I, I read it, I'm done, I finished the whole thing, every single word I read it. No, it, it was the fact that there was a person on the other side of that pen a person who was affectionate for me, a person who cared about me, a person who had feelings for me, a person I cared for and I had affections for. And hearing her words directed at me did something powerful in me. 
And so church, when we come and we, we get along with this book, I hope that we see this as more than just an ancient text written to a bunch of ancient people. But that we understand that there is a real person on the other side of these words. His name is God, the creator of this universe who is expressing his desires and his affections and his, his laws for you. There's a God on the other side of this, not just a God who's way out there, a God who is a lover of your soul, a God who is crazy about you, Kyle. There's a God who's mad about you, Tracy, who's spinning around. Zephaniah tells us that he rejoices over us in singing. Wait, he's dancing over you and singing over you, rejoicing, just dancing circles around you. Song of Songs tells us, Shane, that, that he has a banner over you, and that banner is love. The Gospels tell us that this God is so passionate about us. He pursues us, Keith, so much that he was willing to, to for the joy set before him. And that joy, his name is Keith, he was willing to bear the scorn and the shame of the cross. Bobby, he is willing to hang naked on the cross, taking the humiliation and the, and the embarrassment because he's so mad about you. That is our God. That is the one, the author, the one who breathed into this book. He passionately pursued you. And when we understand that that is who we're coming before, when we take in his word, I pray that that would make us want to be passionate about him, that we would pursue him by pursuing his word. Amen, church? Let's be that kind of people. Would you guys pray with me? Let me, let me pray with you right now. And I just want you to get quiet before God, and let, let's, let's make commitments before the Lord right now. And, and together as a church, we're, we're going to do this corporately. We're going to put this into practice starting next week as we journey through the book of Ephesians. I encourage you and challenge you, make sure you bring your Bibles because we're going to park it in Ephesians and we're just going to dig deep into this rich book. And so we're, we're going to practice that as a whole, but would you talk to the God right now and just say, Lord, I, I just want to commit to you right now that this week, I'm not going to wait till next weekend. I'm going to get with you, and I'm going to take in your word. I'm going to store up the army of, your, of my heart. And that might be through a new commitment in your quiet times. Maybe it's picking up an accountability partner who's going to hold you to it, someone you can share that stuff with. Maybe it's recommitting to your life group, saying, I'm going to study the word with my friends once again. Lord, we thank you so much that this is more than just a faith with a bunch of rules and restrictions. But God, there is a real, a real person, you God, the lover of our souls that we have entered into this relationship with. And I pray that all those times that we come together, whether it's in worship or prayer or missions or reading your book, I pray that we would see that those are just means to a greater end, and that's intimacy with you, God. So, Lord, you know our hearts. You've heard our prayers, Lord. We want to make commitments to you, Lord. We want to renew our commitments to get into your word and to know it well so that it would be on our lips and in our conversations, and that would be the character of this church, people grounded in the word of God. So, Lord, we, we love you. We want to just continue to worship you. With whatever method possible, we just want to worship you. And so together as a church, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.